Does the rapture occur before or after the Great Tribulation? Let's look at some passages of Scripture that will help pinpoint the timing of this event. The timing of when the rapture and when the second coming of Jesus is to occur can be seen in several scriptures that address this topic. There are two events that can help us understand when the rapture, our gathering to Christ, and the second coming of Jesus will occur. Namely, the first resurrection and the day of the Lord. Today, I'd like to take a close look at the second one, the day of the Lord. Now let me start by saying one could write a large book to cover all the scriptures and aspects of the day of the Lord. I'm only going to touch on the timing of the day of the Lord as it pertains to the rapture of the believers. We see Paul discussing the timing of the return of Christ and the day of the Lord in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. In 1st Thessalonians chapter 5, we read in verses 1 through 5, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. I'd like to point out two things about this passage. First, there are two groups. The first group is they or them, they will be saying peace and safety, which could fit with the celebration we see in Revelation chapter 11 when the beast kills the two witnesses. Note in verse 10, And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So they're going to really be celebrating, having a party, New Year's, Christmas, all rolled into one. But we see everything change drastically after three and a half days. See, the second woe ends and the third follows quickly, which is the seventh and final trumpet. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, we read, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the next event in Revelation is found in chapter 16, when the seven bowls or vials of the wrath of God are poured out. Okay, I just had to throw all that in, but getting back to when the rapture occurs as it relates to the day of the Lord, <clears throat> let's look next at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. There we read, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be shaken in mind or troubled by spirit, or by word, or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ, or Lord, had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Paul is telling the Thessalonians that despite some rumors they might have heard, there was no way the day of the Lord had begun because two things have to occur first. The apostasy or 
falling away, and the Antichrist, or man of sin, has to be revealed. Show up. He describes the man of sin in detail, if you read further in the same chapter. There won't be any mistaking who he is once he starts doing his thing. Now let's backtrack. Why did Paul tell them these facts? To prove that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him had not been missed and would not, could not incur until after the beast sets up his kingdom, which we know from Daniel and Revelation will last approximately 42 months or 1260 days. This fits with the other things Paul told the Thessalonians in his first letter. More from chapter 5 of that first letter, verses 4 through 10 this time. We read, But you, brethren, are not in darkness that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light, sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober or alert. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober or alert, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we should live together with him. The return of Christ should not be a surprise to us. We are children of the light and of the day. We are to be watching, and that day should not overtake us as a thief. Only the lost, those who refuse to believe the truth, will be caught off guard, like an unexpected thief of the night coming to rob them. I've gone into more than I need to make my point, but I believe this is another important passage that has been overlooked by the church. Since the church has been told the lie of an any moment, secret, quiet, invisible rapture, they don't understand that they need to be alert and watching. They will unfortunately be caught off guard and likely many will fall away from the faith when they see the world turning upside down and they are still here on earth and not vacationing in heaven for seven years like they were taught. I could see that could be pretty upsetting. All right, sorry, I got off track again. The more I study this subject, rereading all the prophetic passages, I have become more concerned about what I see as another big lie that Satan is using to undermine the truth about God. We have had science telling us we are just a random chance life form for the past century or two. And that lie has caused much grief and sorrow to those seeking meaning and purpose to life. Things we can only find in the Bible and through a relationship with our Creator. A relationship that is available by trusting Him and accepting the gift of eternal life by faith in Jesus, our Savior, Redeemer, if I've not lost you yet, let me share a few more scriptures that help reveal that the timing of the second coming and our gathering occurs at the end of the Great Tribulation. This one includes a bit of the salvation message in it too. Hebrews 9, chapter, chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, we read, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. See, it's all happening there at the same time at the end. 
Now in Acts chapter 3, verses 19 to 21, we read, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. Ah, this is interesting. Verse 21 is what I want you to look at closely. He says, until the times of restoration of all things. The Old Testament prophets are full of scriptures describing the future time of restoration. And it is almost always tied directly to the day of the Lord, or simply in that day. I could fill several pages with quotes, but I'll just suggest you search them on your own if you'd like to see more about what the Old Testament prophets have to say on the subject. I think you'd be surprised. There's a lot in there. One of the best descriptions of the timing of the day of the Lord can be found in the book of Matthew. And in case you believe those words are specifically for end times Jews and not us, I'll include similar passages in Luke and Revelation. Matthew chapter 24, verses 27 through 31, we read, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And for wherever the carcass is, there the eagle be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give us light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Luke chapter 21, verse 27, we read, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. These all sound similar to what Paul describes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which I quoted extensively in the previous post. Another related passage is Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. We read, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I'll be getting more into this remnant who is still alive, yet not raptured at the first resurrection in a future post. Because the question of who will repopulate the earth if the saints are all given glorified bodies at the return of Christ and most of the unbelieving wicked people are killed by the seven bowls of God's wrath is an important question. Who are these remaining tribes of the earth? Who will be mourning when they see Jesus return? I can give you a short answer right now. I believe God is able to provide or preserve those whom he has chosen. And this selection process will play out when he gathers and divides the nation. But again, this requires a whole post of its own, and I'm working on it. But I'll close with this passage as it shows us that the Lord has plans for his remnant. He's made promises. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 3 through 6, we read, But I will gather the remnant of my flock, out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase, and I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. And in his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name, by which he will be called. The Lord our righteousness. 
For more post-trib Bible proofs, be sure to check out the companion video, Post-Tribulation Rapture, First Resurrection Timing.